I'd like to talk about diffraction, which is basically the change in direction of waves when they pass around a barrier. And for diffraction, I'm just going to first take you right away to Paul Falstad's ripple tank, his simulated ripple tank, and we'll have a look right away at what actually happens, and then we'll think about explaining it. So here's our simulated ripple tank. I've set it up so that there's a long line source on the top end here, and in the middle there's a small slit. So there's basically walls and then a small space where the waves can pass through. So that's going to be our, our obstacle. So let's see what happens as we begin our waves. Now you'll notice kind of two things happening. You'll see what's coming through the slit looks basically like a new point source. And on the other side of the slit we have of course waves bouncing off the wall and they're interacting with the original waves again. And We've got some funny sort of ripples on the sides. But that's really interference. That's a, for a later topic. For right now, we're more interested in what happens as it goes through the slit, as it passes around this barrier of a wall here. And we see that the slit in the wall acts like a point source. It almost seems like this was just an oscillating point source by itself. Let's make a few other changes and try some new things. So let's clear this one. Let's get rid of our line source and instead add a point source. And we'll put our point source same spot right at the top there and see what happens now. So again the waves are coming out and now it's a little fainter but through the slit we still have basically the slit acting like a point source. Well, let's try some more. I'm gonna get rid of this slit. I'm also gonna get rid of the line source and I'm going to add my or sorry get rid of my point, so point source and add a line source again. Let's make it nice and long and this time I'm going to add just a box. So this is a solid box. Waves cannot pass through it. We'll have to go around it, we'll clear the waves, and then see what happens. And I'll stop it right there. So obviously, again, what happens here is interference between different waves. I'm more interested in what happens to these waves as they pass around it. And you'll see they kind of curve around it. Again, looking in just this area as if the corner of that box was its own point source. So from a very, maybe a little bit crude perspective, very objective, the waves we can say seem to bend around the object that's in their path. And let's also say that it seems as if the corner of the object is like its own point source. Now of course we have to answer the question why. And to answer the question why, I'm going to draw a little sketch here. So here's our wave crest, and I'm going to have these going, I'm just going to do this slit, or the, the small opening for now, and ask ourselves, why does it appear that as the waves go through here, they kind of seem to be behaving as if that slit is its own point source? I want to bring you back to Dan Russell's webpage and his animations on waves, and remind ourselves what is actually going on with a wave. And whether we have a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave, we have particles oscillating. So in a transverse, rather in a longitudinal wave first, this highlighted red particle is going back and forth, back and forth. It's actually exhibiting simple harmonic motion. Now if we go to a transverse wave, if you were to follow any one of the objects in this transverse wave, it also goes up and down, up and down, up and down, exactly as if it was a mass on a spring, and it's exhibiting simple harmonic motion. So if we go back to our ripple tank and think about what these different lines mean, of course, one of these colors is a crest and one is a trough. And the particles of water are going up and down, up and down, up and down. Now before they get around the obstacle, they're all doing this together. They're all going up and down together. They're exhibiting simple harmonic motion. But after they pass around the corner, they meet a whole bunch of water molecules which are not going up and down. So imagine zooming in on a particle of water just right here as it comes around the corner. It's going up and down, up and down, up and down, but it has to propagate the wave in a direction where there is no wave existing currently. So it's like that particle of water is acting as a point source to propagate the wave in this direction. So maybe the point source even makes more sense to think about it this way. I've adjusted the brightness of this a little bit so that it looks good in the 3D view. And here it's pretty easy to see what's going on, right? We have at this point is the only place where the wave gets through the slit. 
that's acting as a point source because those wave molecules, those water molecules are moving up and down, up and down, which are causing a wave to propagate through the surrounding medium. Now I'm also going to change another factor and see how that affects it. I'm going to change the source frequency so that now our source operates at a very, very high frequency, in other words, a very, very fast oscillation, and we'll see what happens. So we've obviously got short wavelengths as a result, and now if we look at our resulting wave, it's not all that clear, especially on the edges. It's pretty clear in the middle, but not on the edges. So let's compare this to our smallest possible frequency, and now we're going to get a long wavelength for our waves. I'm going to stop it here already. Now the wave is not as clear, it's not as large coming through, but the amount of diffraction is clear all the way around. It's not like we just have diffraction in the center, it's clear all the way around. These outside little circles, by the way, are just because there's little holes in my wall at the end of the tank that I can't quite seal up. But we're focusing on the center one now. And again, if I go to the 3D view, then you'll see that the diffraction happens all the way around equally. Now there's other variables too, like the size of this slit, depending on how close that is to the wavelength of the wave also affects the diffraction. But for now I do want to point out that longer wavelength waves diffract better. And maybe in order to prove this without the size of the slit making a difference, I'm going to put, the, put our box back in the ripple tank. So here's our ripple tank again with a long line source and a solid box. And we're going to start with a very long wavelength or a low frequency. So here we go. Now as that wave comes around the edge, of course it's bending around, it's diffracting. I'm going to stop it and switch to the 3D view here a minute. It's quite clear that this, these waves are still propagating along this box and the diffraction is clear all the way around. Now let's compare that to having a very high frequency source and watching how these waves come around the edge of the box. Now in both cases, of course, they're smaller on this side. But here they, they get so small, in fact, it, it becomes almost hard to know if they're still there or if, how, how good our diffraction is actually occurring. So why does diffraction matter in real life? Why do we study silly things like the amount of bend that a wave undergoes as it goes o around a barrier? Well, let's th think about this scenario with sound. If you if there was no diffraction, then sound would not travel around the bend. Now, you might consider that a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. But normally, if I'm sitting at my desk in my classroom, like I am right now, blabbing at my computer, then if I would yell and my door is open, the sound would travel out the hall and it would go around the bend of my doorway because it diffracts around the obstacle, which is the wall. So if I would start yelling and you were down the hall, you would still hear me. If sound didn't diffract, that wouldn't happen. Then that wave would not travel down the hallway. Now remember this point here. I said longer wavelengths diffract better. Well, it happens that to be that the wavelength of the sounds that we hear and talk, let's say that their wavelength is roughly about around the order of a meter. Okay, so actual sound waves. Now, there's a big variety, but I'm just trying to find a scale here. So actual sound waves, they're like a meter long. Um, they could be a lot longer, they could be a lot shorter, and we can still hear them even if they're up to um, quite a few meters long, or if they're only a few centimeters, and that gives high and low sounds, of course. But this is sort of the scale that they're on. So this scale, these are pretty big waves. They diffract very good. They travel around bends. Well, can you think of anything with a very small wavelength that might not diffract very well? I can give you something. Light. Light has a very small wavelength. In fact, the wavelength of life, light is um, somewhere on the order of about 500 nanometers. So that's about a half of a micrometer. And a micrometer is already a millionth of a meter. So way smaller than even a millimeter. And based on this principle that longer wavelengths diffract better, light does not go around bends very well. Now I won't say it doesn't at all. It certainly does. If you put light through a slit, you might get something more like this. So here's our flashlight shining at a piece of paper or something with a slit in it. You will get a slight diffraction. You will not just have one, one um, 
focused ray coming out of the slit, it will be a little bit wider, and it makes for very interesting physics experiments. But it's nothing like sound does, like sound traveling all the way down the hallway. And this makes sense, right? If I make this school dark, or if you make your house dark and you shine a flashlight in your room, that light doesn't just go around the bend out into the hallway. It might reflect off stuff and it might still be a little bit of light in the hallway, but it's not that it goes around the bend like sound does. Obviously, I also think water is a pretty good real-life scenario. So water in bays or in areas along the shoreline. It also, of course, diffracts, it goes around obstacles depending on the wavelength, but we know water has a pretty big wavelength. It's probably closer to sound generally than it is to light. So it's going to bend around things and it can interact with other waves again. And This is also interesting to study how erosion might take place in different places. So diffraction is a pretty cool concept and it's really all around us in our daily life and we don't even realize it.